Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy, welcome to Abu Dhabi Art. Welcome to today's discussion. And uh, welcome to our speakers. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, begin by talking about what our discussion is about. And then um, maybe discuss the importance of the subject. And then discuss why is it important to talk about now. And then maybe open the um, floor up to questions. So maybe just as a small start, maybe you could just say who you are, what work you've done recently, and then I can jump into the topic. So maybe. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, my name is Mark Quinn. I'm an artist. I live in London. I'm interested in this topic of uh, cultures and communities and connections between people. I'm working at the moment. My biggest project is a project about refugees. And um, I've got a short film that I can show that gives us a kind of opening, and then we can have a little chat about it. Could someone play the film? The refugee crisis is undoubtedly one of the greatest humanitarian tragedies in the world now. I wanted to make a sculpture that was about the refugee crisis. I wanted to make a collaborative project so that the money that the sculpture raised also went to help refugees in Italy. It is the ultimate purest. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's a good introduction about the project. And, and, the, and, yeah. and how it links, I think, to what we're talking about is I wanted to make a piece that was about the it, about refugees, to help refugees, but also a way of cutting through the sort of fatigue you get in the press about stories about it, a way that you can engage people directly. And I think public art, doing something in the urban environment, or not only an urban environment, mainly that, and putting this artwork 
on the street. It's going to be in the New York Public Library on the steps and in different places around the world. People come across it in their daily commute. People walk down the street. They don't know what it is. They're sucked into looking at it. I think that engagement is much stronger than an engagement behind a museum wall or in a in somewhere that is designated for art. So it's, it's I get about how you designate a space, isn't it? And what you put, you bring, it's in a way, I guess it's a Marcel Duchamp thing, isn't it? You bring in something from the real world into an art gallery and it disrupts an art gallery and becomes art, or you take something from an art gallery and put it in the real world and it disrupts the real world in some way. So I think that's how a way to communicate with people now in the 21st century, how to get people and a wide variety of people to kind of engage, to create debate, to create ideas, and to sort of, you know, to acknowledge that really we're all, this, we're all human beings and we all live together on the planet once. And it sounds a bit soppy when you say it like that, but it's sort of a fundamental question and that all these other things like nationality and religion and race uh, are all invent our own inventions. So we invent something and then we forgot we're inventing it and we let us control us. So it's that kind of, it's about how we create myths that, that control us and but it's linked to so many other different things as well. Thank you very much. Um, I think maybe I'll put you on the spot for a little bit. Um, maybe we can switch to Elimira Reem's uh, book. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, some of the work that you do uh, about the book as well. And then I can put it back to the topic. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Al-Amira Reem Al-Hashimi. I am an architect, an urban planner, and a writer. I recently published the, the first English language, uh, I guess, urban history on uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, which focuses really on, I would say, four main themes um, centered around three, the three rulers since the discovery of oil in 1960 in commercial quantities, uh, Sheikh Shahbut, uh, bin Sultan Nahyan, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Nahyan, and uh, the current leadership. And the four themes are revolved around, um, you know, the leadership's approach to development um, and their vision uh, for, for urban development. Uh, the second one is on planning institutions and urban government governance and how those uh, impacted. Um, then the third theme, which is the, you know, bringing in the planning experts um, and how their ideas shape the city, and finally how the city was shaped, um, so you know, the, the, the urban fabric. Um, I'm currently also working as the cultural advisor uh, to the Assistant Undersecretary of the Arts and Heritage Sector at the Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development, uh, where we are setting up uh, the first architecture department, uh, emphasizing the role of architecture as a key pillar of culture. Um, and we are launching the UAE architecture project, sort of a brand, uh, soon, coming soon, uh, with lots of, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, gusto. Uh, we're very excited about uh, uh, the, the work that we're doing in terms of research publications, um, you know, trying to show a significance of, of, of the built environment in the UAE and raise general awareness and, and create like a shared um, dialogue and and critical research um, on, on the built environment in the UAE. Oh, thank you. Maybe may want. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name is Maywand and I am I can relate very well to this topic because I am the son of refugees. So um, um, since 2010, I've been running FPMI. FPMI is a community development project in Afghanistan, uh, founded by Her Highness Sheikh Fatima bin Mohammed bin Zayed daughter of the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. And we, in a way, we support ladies in Afghanistan to stop them going through this journey and um, becoming refugees abroad. We support them by giving them jobs, uh, access to education for their children, a livelihood, um, you know, an opportunity to take care of themselves and take control, regain control of their lives. And, um, you know, I mean, 
it's all about resonating and you know it, my story itself is uh, all that of my parents for example in 1985 they left uh, Afghanistan my father was a cadet with the uh, with the government he was a police officer and then they captured him and they the mujahideen at the time captured him and took him to prison in Kandahar to, to have him uh, killed so he was on death row somehow he managed to uh, befriend one of the mujahideen and let him get away so they traveled on donkey back with my mother and my uh, elder brother at the time you know it's through the mountains they got to Pakistan and you know they were human traffickers there so the human traffickers obviously relatives helped out they paid them and they thought they're going to Germany so they sit on the plane and they land and they're in London so that's the story of uh, how I was born a couple of years later and um, you know you should definitely be part of the project then you, <laughs> you need your blood <laughs> I think I have. I think that's your strategy to get everyone's <laughs> blood here, right? <laughs> it would be a pleasure, honestly. I mean, it's 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 a shame that it's the first time that I've heard of the project, but it, it would be an absolute honor to be a part of it. And I think I have the kind of blood that you can take and give. I don't know what is it, O plus or something. Yeah. Is it? O <laughs> <laughs> well, we we don't need it for medical. I mean, the great thing about <laughs> the project, you can get blood from anyone. We don't. But only about thirty percent of the population can give blood medically, but we can take blood from anyone. Amazing, amazing. And the photo up here is that of my elder brother, of course. So he was six months old when he left Afghanistan with my parents. And um, the main line of work that we're in is basically giving the Afghan ladies an opportunity to weave handmade carpets. And 2000 of uh, 2019 being the year of tolerance, of course, in the UAE, we came up with a carpet called the Tolerance Carpet. And uh, engraved on the carpet is the script, is a small uh, section of the document that was signed by His Holiness the Pope when he visited Abu Dhabi in uh, February 2019. So if you guys have time, please pass by and have a look as well. The booth is CP04 and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, now that we've introduced everybody, we can kind of jump into the topic. What I'd like to do is maybe uh, briefly t uh, t touch on the, on the topic itself. Um, which is displacement and what role culture plays in communities. Uh, but also I think w as a, when I was in the university, a, a professor of mine had said something quite important which I have not forgotten. And he said, when you are given the responsibility of speaking to an audience, try not to answer uh, or ask uh, the what and the when questions, but try to uh, ask the why and the how. And the reason why the why and the how are important is because what you do is you extract uh, the reasoning behind why specific conditions exist the way they are. And how as a collective people uh, we are attempting to respond to the why. And so the, the question is, is why is this topic important today? Uh, we, we live in quite divisive times. Um, climatically, uh, the world um, is, is going through extreme uh, weather conditions today as well. Um, and as a consequence of this, uh, of climate issues, there are displacements. People are moving from coastal cities uh, more inland. Um, droughts are affecting settlements, and therefore uh, people are moving from one geography to another. Economically, um, there are migration patterns happening from rural to urban environments because economic opportunities exist more there. And uh, socio-culturally, I think ideologically, people are more divided than they ever have been, uh, or from what memory serves. Um, and, and so it's quite important uh, to understand that this why question uh, has attempts of addressing them, whether it's through the arts, uh, whether it's through architecture, or whether it's through craft. Uh, and I think it's important that we have these forms of dialogues uh, to bridge any forms of misunderstandings uh, dialogically by having conversations, but also dialectically, how architecture plays uh, an intrinsic role in building communities or how craft stops people from moving from one place to another. Uh, and so 
then I will, uh, I think I will ask maybe perhaps one question each and then given that we're quite intimate today, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. Um, thank you very much for that video, that was wonderful. Uh, and we're, we're fans of a lot of the people that uh, we saw. Um, I would imagine that, that part of the reason why you intervene in public environments, and I think that's what the art project is about, it's an intervention in people's minds and people's hearts. How, how does this relate to refugees? And, and how do we know that this will bridge mis any misunderstandings? Well, we can never predict what will happen. But I mean, what I'm not sure I said, or maybe it said in the video, is the whole thing is a non-for-profit operation. It's not, it's, um, I created a charity that, that owns the work and that will, that will take it around the world. And any profits we make from the tour, which we plan to make, will go to refugee causes. Half will go to the IRC, which is the world's biggest refugee charity, and half to smaller you know, refugee charities doing more specialized things around the world. But I think that apart from the money, what's important is to raise the awareness and to raise debate and to have people talking about it and understanding this idea of difference is a culturally created idea and something that, well, I mean, I guess migration has always been with us. The whole history of the world is the history of migration. We all come from Africa. And uh, what would be interesting as well is to sample um, DNA, sample all the blood that's given as well if we get the permission of the person giving it, and then draw these maps of migration of the two blocks. And without saying which block they come from, I think it, they'd be very, very similar because we all similar. And I think the other thing is to give people a voice. So every person who gives blood also makes a video about themselves, they or it doesn't have to be about whatever they want to say. <coughs> and these videos are projected around the city where the sculpture is shown. So I think by giving people an equal voice, by taking the most famous people in the world and people who are so, you won't even let into your society, and then giving them an equal platform, an equal voice, I think that is how you communicate with people is is when you hear someone's story directly, like we just heard here, it's so much more powerful than any abstraction about people p moving around. It's all about individual stories and individual people and trying to create a situation where, through an artwork, where you can engage with multiple individuals at the same time, or not at the same time, but sequentially, and just, Sort of, it's a bit like meeting the person in real life. It should be, and then, yeah, I think that the urban doing it in the urban public space. I did the Alison Napa sculpture at the Fourth Plinth in Trafalgar Square, which was a sculpture of a disabled pregnant lady, and it changed how people talked about disability in the UK and around the world. So that showed me that by disrupting a public space with a difficult subject, with a subject that people don't want to think about directly, you can engage them to think about it in a more positive way. Um, I remember seeing that, um, and it was quite powerful. And it was the first plinth uh, project, uh, which continues now in London, in Trafalgar Square. Um, El Amir Arim. Um, you know, in the UAE, we always talk about 200 nationalities. We talk about its diverseness. Uh, you know, last year, Sheikh Abdullah commemorated Dr. Takahashi, uh, his family, who was one of the uh, initiators of the Abu Dhabi Master Plan in the 60s. And then you have Dr. Makhlouf, uh, Cedric Price proposed a project, Oscar Neumayer's proposed a There was so many architects uh, that played uh, a, a, an intrinsic role in forming the city and, and forming within them communities. How has 
since given that we're in Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. maybe we could talk about that a little bit. And I know that there's another discussion, which is the sense of belonging conversation, which you wanted to maybe talk about as well. So I'll yeah. leave that to you. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, and when, when Abu Dhabi's uh, urban development was instigated after the, you know, there was an increase in oil wealth, um, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of these different uh, architects or planners were, you know, coming to the city. They were invited to the city by um, uh, the late Sheikh Zayed, uh, God rest his soul, and they all came with their different uh, ideas for the city because obviously they had all either trained uh, in the UK or in the US or. Um, Jap Japan or whatnot, and and uh, or even Egypt, as Dr. Makhlouf and, and Germany also, he was influenced um, by his uh, studies in Europe, and you know it became an amalgamation, I would say, of ideas uh, that were that that made Abu Dhabi what it is today, and I think that's actually um, it, it's it, what's amazing is that there is this top-down uh, planning uh, of the city. But then, of course, there was because there were opportunities for an influx of, of inhabitants. On the other hand, there were all these um, community uh, um, activities that were that were transforming urban space as well. Um, and 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 for for these communities to feel a sense of belonging in a in a in a new city, they um, ended up creating their own spaces um, you know, where they felt like they belonged. And this is actually a project that we're working on. As you mentioned, the Year of Tolerance, the, uh, we're working on a, on a publication uh, through the ministry called the Spaces of Co In Search of Spaces of Coexistence in the UAE, uh, an architecture journey. And actually, it's, uh, what, we, what we didn't want to do was only focus on places of worship, which has usually been the case, like tied to, to tolerance. We wanted to look also at the community level, um, going into the more uncommon spaces or the underdogs, as we would call them, um, where community gathers um, and and you know they come together and they have this like shared meaning and collective memory. Um, whether it's a whether it's a sports center or a cultural center. There was one uh, temple that we that we uh, went to that's I think pretty popular right now in in uh, Bur Dubai the 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 what is it called the Gara Nanak uh, temple it's a Hindu temple yeah and you know just on, on the creek right yeah, yeah by the creek exactly it was established in 1958 wow. and what's really amazing is a lot of uh, you know we know that the UAE like in its history has always been a crossroads of cultures. And you know, it, it, its, it's uh, ports have been the locus for mercantile elites to, uh, and, and even um, refugees and, and uh, people from the diaspora to come and make this place home. And because of trade and, and also it's, uh, as I mentioned, like its location on the ancient Silk Road. Um, so a lot of the, the communities were, were Hindu, um, you know, from, from the Indian subcontinent. And so they really needed a, a place to 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 you know to practice their worship, um, and so the in, in 1958, uh, Sheikh Rahd Shad bin Said Maktoum gave them uh, the space. So it's just been really it's been really nice like going and exploring these spaces and and being able to shed light on them because, as I said, on the one hand we've got the top down like architects coming from all over the place with their ideas for what has transformed the urban fabric. But on the other hand, you've got the community and their needs and their um, you know, desire for a sense of belonging that's created these little spaces with like intangible almost uh, um, culture uh, creating space. I remember doing a walk there because that's where the textile uh, market is. So mm -hmm. as kids, my, my mom and my grandmother would make me carry stuff behind them when they walked around buying textiles. And we would always uh, pass by that Hindu temple. Um, and recently, I think the reason why they had chosen that site is I think um, 
drawing back to the earlier conversation about creating a sense of belonging mm. is I think the creek uh, reminded them of the Ganges and it's kind of that water spirituality yeah. relationship which was quite interesting. Um, yeah, so may one technical, I mean, I'll let you speak, but I want, I, I've been thinking about asking you this technical question, which I think is interesting is, is as economic situations in Afghanistan change as a consequence of uh, interventions, um, do you think that the initiative kept people where they are? Do you think that, that, that the craft, the looming of carpets embedded within communities kept them intact? Or if the, if the craft had left, do you think that the communities would have uh, uh, left as well? I think if you look at the last half a century uh, globally, the country that's been most impacted or affected by um, you know, displacement, whether it's internally or whether it's global, has been Afghanistan the last 50 years, if you look at the last half a century. Um, what we try to do uh, you know, is, is the one thing that's most important to people, even during uh, war or during times of displacement, is to give them jobs, give them livelihoods. Um, but then there's another side to it as well. Whilst we try to give them jobs and livelihoods and s security, what people want is security at the end of the day. I think any kind of uh, displacement the end goal is security. If you're, if you're staying in Afghanistan or any country, for example, uh, that's affected, let's say Syria, unfortunately, you want security, that's what you want. Or whether you travel abroad and you want to reach, let's say, Germany or the United States, wherever you go, you want to be um, accepted, you want security, you want, to, you, know, you want for the host nation to tolerate you, to have that understanding yeah. of tolerance as well. You know, that's very important. So definitely, whilst we give these uh, women and their families jobs, we support uh, their families, it supports the local economy, it helps them stay where they are, it helps them stay at home. Because traditional um, societies or patriarchal societies such as Afghanistan, they, the, the ladies want to work at home, they want to stay at home. So giving them access to carpet weaving or small jewellery making or small uh, crafts and cottage based industries lets them stay secure and feel secure, earn in the house. And that's what they want at the end of the day. Um, but on the other side, since 2010, when we started, the crowd, we've seen that, you know, whilst the ladies who are weaving, they earn money, they give it to the children to go and study. And the children aren't interested in studying craft. <laughs> you know, they're interested in studying English and computer. And, and they've moved on from the, you know, the children have, have, have migrated as well. They've gone abroad. They've, it's, so it's a form of economic migration for the children as well, which, of course, there's no negativity to it. You know, we're happy to see them growing and succeeding in life. But on the same side, um, you know, it means that the arts and the crafts are dying, unfortunately, or it's not going to keep up at the same pace it's been keeping up the last few hundred years, unfortunately. But, um, you know, it, it's very important because at the end of the day, when we look at it, not only is it a form of creating jobs and, for, for example, combating child marriages or child brides or uh, opium production, you know, giving them an opportunity to do something else uh, instead of growing opium work on the looms, um, you know, the one thing that will be always be exported is that that sort of um, architecture. You know, when we go abroad, we always buy something that's, let's go, when we go to Italy, we buy the leading tower of pizza, the small um, globe, or these. So that's very, very important when it comes to uh, exporting. I think the only way that people can do that is obviously study abroad or uh, migrate. Uh, it's always good to migrate economically, of course. But, th but the main thing is that sense of security. I think most people, no matter what they do, they, when they migrate, they look for security. And, and even when we keep, keep providing them jobs, um, it keeps them in Afghanistan, of course. It, it makes sure that they don't move too much and they're safe and secure and happy. Mark, you're looking at him as if you want to ask a question. Sorry? <laughs> do you want to ask him a question? Um, yeah. I, have, I was actually listening to him. I wasn't thinking of oh, a question. Sorry, it's okay, but fine. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to um, open it up so that we can have a conversation together um, and maybe ask some questions and see if we can have uh, more of a conversation about this. Obviously, I, I have two or three other questions that I'd like to ask, but maybe I will hijack one of the uh, audience's question and maybe weave my question into it. So. Um, <laughs> 
I hope it's not a tough question. Uh, well, uh, there are specific places of, of the world talking about refugees where the, there are a, a lead, I mean, a huge social, social, ma and humanitarian crisis. But here in this country, we live a kind of, how can I tell you, society where everything seems to be perfect. I have lived here six years. So I have a question that probably we don't know yet, but what is the level of engagement that you, for example, ministries in general, or the government itself, involve you and your high power, institutional power, in order to help these migrants outside? Because no matter if he's not here, we don't, we don't see migrants here. People who come here has a specific task Unfortunately, some of them very hard and some others not. So what is your level of universal engagement with other peoples, other cultures that are living real social disasters as UAE government? Um, I think she was looking at you, but I, I can... Uh I mean, yeah, and then I can jump in too, because I mean, for us, as the Ministry of Culture, I, in I general, can't, in general. In general oh. I mean, I think um, Ahmed's much more I, I place I to answer that I mean, question. It's a very first of all, let me acknowledge that it's a very important question. And I think, um, like I, I said earlier, um, you know, the, the disparity between incomes globally uh, is, is an issue that takes precedence all over the world and borders all over the world. Um, I think what uh, the beauty of, of Mark's project in specific is it tries to uh, take the image away uh, from the job, uh, the job or characterizing the individual as either a marg migrant or a worker or a rich individual to fundamentally say that all human beings are, are one and kind of our collective uh, future um, is is one, and I think um, w whether it's the UAE or whether it's the United States or whether it's Europe with the Syrian uh, crisis or or even Asia as well, I think the world needs to make sure that it addresses uh, these disparities. Um, and I think today's conversation is 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 about this: is about what role. Not, not what the problems are, but what role can culture play in bridging that divide? And I think I'd like to root that, uh, that uh, the, the, the conversation in, in how we can respond to this uh, through culture. I'm sorry to add one more element, yeah, please. please. Uh, what I was trying as well to think that this fabulous safety that we live here is safe. There is a kind of a, you know very organized system that we are very lucky to live every day that uh, sense of we, we feel that we are safe, we can leave everything around us and we don't feel aggressed in any way. So this is an incredible civic goal. Um, of course, all the countries are, and especially the more powerful countries. Uh, we will love to see them more you know, involved in this type of humanitarian crisis. But I w when I was talking or pointing, let's say, uh, UAE that is now my country as well as foreign artists. So it's about we we don't feel in the way how other countries feel yeah. that that let's say uh, permanent crisis. Yeah. You know we we are one of the rares uh, probably here we don't feel that the uh, horrible uh, situation that others feel. So in yeah. that way how uh, we can you know or the government in this case I am curious about what what uh, you are doing as a country, having the power to do, uh, to, let's say, uh, be involved and help in a better way? Um, yes, very important. And I can respond to it in, in two ways. Um, uh, in the first manner, I think there are, and there exists technical institutions like the FBMI, uh, like the, uh, um, you know, the Red Crescent that gets involved technically in assisting uh, these situations. And the UAE is, is, I think, one of the top three global donors after Scandinavian countries to respond uh, in a responsible manner 
to global humanitarian conditions. And I've seen it time and time again when there are floods in Asia, when there are uh, natural disasters in countries. Um, the UAE is always on the ground one of the first people. And I think I take incredible pride uh, as a national, and I see it uh, everywhere in, in the news. But, um, but about, I'd like to respond to this fable of security as well. I think it's quite an important uh, topic. Um, you know, we're, uh, you know, the city, the country, and, and the city that, that, that we live in is, is, is truly beautiful because we feel comfortable wherever we are. And, uh, and, and you know, even Japan, for example, uh, I once left my wallet in a phone booth uh, for six or seven hours. Um, and I came back to find my, my wallet exactly in the same place uh, where I left it. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to say in this point is the UAE is not the only place in the world that has that type of security, but we are, we're very grateful that we have it. And there are multiple um, layers of, of, of society that engage within the city that makes it, and Japan, unique in their own different ways. I want to give another person an opportunity to answer th uh, to ask a question, but I'm, I'm happy to have a further conversation afterwards. You, you, it's a tough question, so you've left the gap. Hi, and thank you very much for uh, this uh, beautiful talk. I was interested <coughs> by uh, our blood to know how uh, did you select the, the people who uh, participated to that project? Uh, was it people you knew or encounters you had? Uh, well, it's a mixture. Um, we reached out to refugees through refugee organizations and through word of mouth through different, you know, once you get some people on, they get their friends on and all this kind of thing. And then we work with refugee charities and, and all this kind of thing. And then the people who are not refugees, we have a website as well called blood Q, uh, ourblood.org. And if you go there, any one of you can register to give blood for the project. So it's a, it's a public thing as well. And I think also what's interesting, just going back to the question before, as well, I'm going to answer both at the same time, is for me, what's interesting about moving the project around the world is it has different resonances in different places. Like you showed in America, it's about America is a, sit a country built on immigration, and yet now there's n they're not allowing it. You show it in Lebanon, and it's a country that is, you know, that has a third of the population are, uh, are refugees and has a whole different history. The way people react, the way people talk about it, what effect it will have to be different. You show it in the UAE here, and it brings up perhaps that very question you asked of this is the situation, what can we do about it? And maybe enables that dialogue to become something. So I think for me, it's really not only about different cultures, but about engaging different cultures by moving the artwork to different places. And in those different places, being to me, part of the artwork is how people react to it and the debate that's caused by it, a very important part of the artwork, almost half of the artwork, I'd say. And so it's really a, almost a performance piece in that way, in that you bring it there, you put it there, it's like an, a catalyst that starts a reaction and then all the debate, all the ideas, all the changes perhaps in how people think about things, that w it's almost, that's why I call it a social sculpture. It's about also changing societies in different ways or, or perhaps giving people ideas. Or I, I have no idea what will happen, but it's just starting this little reaction and seeing what could happen in different places. Maybe uh, just before we ask one more question, I wanted to ask about the role of technology. Mm. Because I think, you know, one of the main catalysts, I understand, I was reading an article about uh, migration from Southeast Asia in particular to the West, is because all, you know, kids in slums immediately have access to how kids live in the Western world. And that, you know, builds a driver. And I think what you do with, uh, not only the installation itself, but the pr representation of the ideology. Absolutely. And I think engaging people through social media and stuff will be hugely important. 
And I completely think I agree with you. And I think that's changing. You know, we see all these sort of revolutions happening around the world now. And these revolutions could not happen without social media, without WhatsApp and Instagram, where people can communicate directly. And you have a, a bottom up sort of way of, of creating change rather than in a country where all the media is controlled from above. And if you don't have social networks, then it, it, it's not going to change. So uh, I think it's not probably the intention of people who started social networks, but it is one of the defining things of where we live now, is that, as you say, you can be in the middle of nowhere and you can see what some celebrity is doing in New York at the same time, and it can make you think, what, what is this world? And so I think that whole thing is an incredibly important um, part of, of how the world is going to change in the, in the next decades, because this won't go away for good and for bad hi hello uh, my question is to to all of you or to whoever have uh, an answer to this the subject is displacement the role of culture um, in this and um, it's a bit of a general question to know what do you think of the fact that culture is also what makes us different, and culture is generally also a reason for um, for a problem in displacement. So it's in a way a remedy and a cure. We are talking about a remedy here because it could find solutions to integrate. But at the origin, it's the refusal of certain cur culture and displacement that is the cause. So could the the pain itself be the remedy at the same time and what do you think of it i was actually having this discussion just an hour ago with my wife you know just before this started uh because you know if you look at uh, let's say um, from my personal experience like the uk you know we i come from afghanistan so i was born in the uk afghans generally they don't tend to mix too well in the uk they don't tend to integrate with the society there but my, my wife, on the other hand, was like, no, they do, you know, simply because they don't have a strong culture. It's not like the Indian culture, for example. When you go to the UK, it's evident. Um, you know, you see the takeaways, you see, uh, you know, all of these different things. So it's actually quite a tricky one at the same time. It's a tricky question. I think it has, a, it has both sides. Like when you look at um, uh, where I was born in London, there's the biggest Hindu temple outside of India anywhere in the world, you know, but I've never visited it myself, you know, and it's right on my doorstep, literally. Um, when I was growing up, for example, at school at the time, when I'd say I'm from Afghanistan, people wouldn't know where Afghanistan was. Nobody knew where Afghanistan was. Even my classmates, they didn't know. Uh, but now you'd struggle to find someone who doesn't know where it's from. So I think the media has a lot to do with it. Technology has a lot to do with it as well, for example. Um, I, I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. I think, um, you know, obviously, whilst migration is good, it gives an opportunity um, for those who are w not so well off in their own countries. Um, at the same time, some, some cultures tend to integrate better into society. And I was reading about this uh, as well. Uh, if you look at the Jamaicans, for example, who came across in the about 50 years ago to the UK, or four, they integrated, Windrush. yeah, exactly, Windrush. They integrated absolutely fine, you know, simply because they, th it was more or less the same culture, I think. I think they, they went to the pubs and they drank with the locals and they enjoyed themselves. but. If you look at uh, the the, the sub sub uh, continent of India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know they didn't do so well. So um, I, think I, the, I, think I think the culture of music helps here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I think the culture of music. You know, so or some really cultures are more trendy than others. Exactly, that's that's <laughs> what it is. I mean, some cultures and then some foods. You know, you have food, you have architecture. So it's really it depends on the way you look at it. In my opinion, anyway. Yeah, but it's a very good question. I'd like to add something, but from I mean, I'm gonna frame it probably more so like from a planning perspective or a spatial perspective, because that's my, my, my field. But when I think about um, like migrant communities and the diaspora, we were having this conversation earlier, diasporic space tends to, I guess, do both. It affects or shapes the urban fabric, but at the same time, the context or the contextualization of the locale in which the migrant community or the diaspora space is being created is, is affected by that locale. So by that locale's culture, 
by its economic policies, by its uh, you know, urban regulations. Um, so they're kind of simultaneously constructing each other. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, like as a planner, it's a very balancing act, I would say. Um, because you want to, for, for the migrant communities or the displaced communities to um, leave their imprint uh, on, on an urban landscape, they need to have rights to the city, whether it's the right to design or the right to a public space, to use a public space, or the right to not feel alienated in urban life, you know, and, and, and with that, like, be able to live in difference, right, um, or, or the right to, di to be different. Um, so it's really a very, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, mutually constitutive or not even mutually exclusive conversation. They, they both sort of affect each other. It's, it's a tricky one, for sure. I just wanted to add about displacement. Uh, it's not a thing that's happening just nowadays. It's over history. Because of war, because of natural crisis, because of uh, drought, whatever. So culture used to transfer through those people displaced from their original countries because there at that time there were no borders. And even in a, in a certain country, you have people on the borders that are shifting between two cultures. And I can say that the displacement uh, uh, has done a positive thing in all cultures around the world in introducing those displaced people, uh, their culture, beautifying whatever was there, uh, maybe elevating some of the habits uh, from because those who are uh, displaced are not necessarily underprivileged or not educated or not uh, uh, gifted with some artisan work. They have added rather than just suffer. And uh, maybe through their displacement, they have maintained some culture, uh, their culture with them, added to the culture of the place where they have settled. So Anna, I believe this is how we integrate this is how culture is mixed together to the better. And um, I don't want to take it in a bad thing, but I believe that um, uh, communities who has migrated for any reason has really added rather than being only isolated by itself. And this is something wonderful we are supposed to really celebrate it. And I really thank you very much for all the uh, individual uh, initiatives that help us to understand each other and mingle around, not uh, only on a personal level, but also on a cultural level. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll use that, uh, that applause uh, unless somebody wants to... The, the yeah. Just one thing I was thinking, I mean, I completely agree with you, and that's what creates cultures, the mixing and remixing and, um, of, of all the ingredients in a way. It's like it just creates something richer. And it's interesting, I just went to the Louvre for the first time this morning, and I was walking around, I was thinking, this is different to other museums, I'm trying to think what it is. And I realized it's instead of having one room Egypt, one room Greece, one room whatever, here everything is mixed up. And it, in a way, the museum is talking about the same thing. It's talking about how cultures have things in common, how they've influenced each other, how they've moved throughout the world. And I think, so in that way, I think it's an incredibly modern museum and enlightened in the way that it's looking at world culture uh, uh, in much what how you're talking about. So that's a very interesting context for this talk to be happening. I'll sneak one more question in. Um, hello, um, th thank you for uh, listening to you. Um, I'm from Berlin, my name is Beate, and I wonder why are we still thinking in classes um, there are some countries where we are, where it's the first class, the second class, the third class, and then the people which don't even have a class. So if, um, why is this not um, a bigger point in this discussion? If we wouldn't have all those classes, I guess we wouldn't have all those problems. 
isn't that part of it? But I, I think isn't that part of it to do with culture? I think the classes comes with culture. You know, when you go to let's say different different countries, or I, I don't want to name any, but the culture is what um, you know what 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 sort of segregates different people. I, I know cer certain countries that I'm aware of, for example. But again, that comes back to culture at the end of the day. Is it is it good to break down that culture, or do we just continue with the with the classes? You know, do we could like you have caste systems as well. Um, I think more than anything else, more than people tend to blame religion as well, you know, but it's more to do with culture. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm not really blaming, I'm just questioning because if we still have the system of classes all over the world, we are going to use in those countries and cultures those people to serve other people all the time and they won't have a chance to integrate. Then they move across somewhere else and there they have the same part of life. They can't integrate because they are coming out of a different class. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, w when Ma Mark and I were talking in the beginning, I think we talked about money briefly and we said, you know, money is, is, is a kind of a myth and, and uh, that we collectively agree on and uh, there's a sense of imagined uh, collective agreement and I would also imagine that the you know the class system also is an idea that uh, permeates uh, time and space. Uh, but the beauty of technology, and this is what I think we discussed when we said that technology enables the disruption of traditional ideologies and allows the young uh, slum dweller to just break away and have immediate access to a new life and a new world. And I've seen it time and time again, and we see it in movies where, where people uh, historically, uh, it took one or two generations to, to migrate from one geography to another as a result of displacement. Today can do it instantaneously as a result of technology and access. So I think, you know, we have tried to address uh, class within this discussion, but uh, also I'd like to make sure that I get invited again. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> to get <laughs> you know, invited I mean again, I have to make sure that I <laughs> stay on track uh, with time. You know, this is why this is the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not expecting an answer. answer okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, speakers. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, Abu Dhabi Art. Thank you. Thank you.